Okay, Shuya, we're going again. Is it recording? Yes, lovely. Okay, so, all right, so for people at home, okay, so we've now figured out a way to remember because we're looking at um, comparative uh, anatomy or structure. So, homologous features, we're talking about the hands. So, similar structure, but that, that structure will have a different function in us. We write in whales, they swim. In crocs, they walk, and in uh, there's a question on mole once, so that's why I remember moles they dig. Okay, then analogous structures, A4, able to fly. Bird's wing is membrane and blood vessels. Bat's wing is thin little bones and membrane. And butter, no. Butterfly wing is membrane and what did I just say? Bird's wing is um, bones and feathers. Butterfly wing or fly, yeah, butterfly wing is membrane and blood vessels. And bat wing is membrane with thin bones. Okay. Now there's an, normally another structure that I do here, vestigial organs, but we're going to look at that later. So the next um, ev uh, piece of evidence for evolution is biogeography, which is actually already this stuff. The distribution of organisms. Okay. So the distribution of organisms and how that's changed by bi biological distribution of organisms over time. All right. And know how the, the um, tectonic um, this continental drift has helped with that process all right so similar climatic regions so along the equator they would have similar kinds of animals and plants and you know north and south so in australia you find i don't know if you know the bottle brush plant it's got like little red spiky flowers it looks like a bottle brush you find them in Australia and you find them in South Africa even. So that shows, well, with other evidence that, you know, when, when it was still Pangaea, that plant um, evolved on that, con that supercontinent and then when the continent separated, you now have very similar species in both Australia, Africa and even South America. They have those plants there. But then the other one was an example of the, they called rat types. So the rat types, although you don't really need to know that word, in case you see it, it's the big birds who can't fly. So the rat type in South America, we said was the? Rhea. No. Yes. I always get these two wrong. So Rhea, South um, America, South America, Africa, Ostrich, Australia, Emu. Okay, so when it was one continent, then there was some common ancestor that gave rise to those different species over time when the continent separated due to continental drift. When Pangaea, the supercontinent, separated into different continents. All right, and, and they, you know, they're similar. If you go, well, South America, part of it's are similar to Af you know, Africa, and Australia is quite similar. So they're ecologically the same. The type of niches they have there are similar, and that's why those rat types, um, emus, ostriches, and deers are able to survive there. And there they are. Okay. There's another bird in Australia, Australia called the cassowary. It's blue and ugly. It's got a blue neck or head, and it's so vicious. And you go, we don't want that. Scary. Yes. Okay, then the rodents of South America and Australia and Africa. So these, um, you know, um, you get rodents that are similar. So um, I'm just trying to think what she means here. So I think they're similar to other continents as well. And then you've got the marsupials. Oh, wait. That um, you get different animals in these different continents as well. So you only get these types in South America because they evolved when South America was when South America was separate, and you only get lots of antelope in Africa. So those animals evolved in Africa separately, and you get um, marsupials, the ones that keep their babies in pouches when they're born very young, only in Australia. So I'm thinking there was a common ancestor, and then the continent separated, and there were these very um, probably similar animals which underwent totally different adaptive radiation. They became very different. Rodents are different to marsupials for those specific ones. The cavi and the capybara. Okay, do you understand what I'm trying to say? They evolved on their own continents because they had their own evolutionary changes. All right. That's not a, an example that I've used, I must say. All right, so there's lots of reading. 
Yeah, so it depends, are you talking about that the common ancestor was there when Pangaea was around, and then like Austria, Emu and Rhea, then they evolved on their own peak, on their own continent when Pangaea broke up, or like the slide before, um, did they, did the evolution happen when the continents were already separated? So rodents, these funny rodents, capybaras in South America, um, antelope in Africa, and marsupials in Australia. But they're mammals, they do come from some kind of common ancestor. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Oh, and then just one thing you might remember from grade eight. Okay. Come on, go away. It says something at the bottom here. Where's it gone? Oh, there. Laurasia is north. So the, su the supercontinent at the north was called Laurasia, like Asia's at the top. And Gondwana land was all the southern continent. Okay, you remember that? Pangaea, and then they separated and the continent separated. Okay. Right, there's lots of rats in there. So I think, yeah, she's just explaining here what's happening. So Australia was isolated for, uh, by water. Oh, because it's an island. Well, Africa's also a big island. So they, they've been separated for so many uh, millions of years from the other continents, Africa and Australia, that um, these animals like marsupials evolved without competition. And you even find the duckbill platypus there, you know, the one that's kind of half oviparous and half mammal. Okay, half, it's a mammal that lays egg on it, is what I mean. All right, so that's just a story that you can go to. And Darwin's finches as well. So we've talked about Darwin's finches, about these um, ancestral birds that somehow got to the islands and then their own beaches. We've talked about that ad nauseum. I think we're fine there. Um, and these guys, these are all the, so that's a koala bear, and those are lemurs and marsupials. So they are found in Australia, but you also find lots of lemurs and that in Madagascar. That's what I've read up on. And in Madagascar, because Madagascar was separated off the east coast of Africa, they've got so many giants and the small lemurs there, and most of them are nearly extinct because of human intervention and cutting down of their forests. So they evolved from a common ancestor to give rise to all these very um, beautiful and very uh, diverse group of lemurs, diverse species. But now they're worried about them being endangered and becoming extinct. But that's because it's separated from Africa. So that's where you find lots of lemurs. And in fact, there's another example. You all know the baobab tree in South Africa. There's a beautiful one in um, near Skakuza in Kruger Park. Now, if you look at the baobab trees in Madagascar, I should pull up a picture. They are huge and they look really odd compared to ours. They almost look like ancient trees from some kind of carboniferous forest millions of years ago. Because they arose, they both arose from a common ancestor. We've got our baobabs and they've got these very odd, beautiful looking baobabs. They are really amazing. In one of my powerful. Okay, so different species on different continents are much greater than different than the differences on, of species on one continent. That makes sense, because continents have split, so there's more differences in those species that are evolving there, but less differences in the species on, say, in Africa, because that's the environment. All right, so they, they may have a de um, evolved, sorry, um, they may have mutations that allow them to be adapted to that environment, that changing environment. Remember that whole story again. All right, we must try and beat it. So that's biogeography. So now the next bit about evidence of evolution, well, I mentioned this already, the fact that we can now sequence DNA and figure out what type of enzymes or proteins it makes. And um, so ultimately, all organisms have DNA. Okay, some viruses don't, but we all have DNA and we all nucleotide, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. It's the same type of molecule. It's the arrangement of the bases that is different, that makes us very different to an amoeba and a kangaroo and a bird and whatever. Okay, so that's what they're talking about here. We might have, we've got very similar genetic code to chimps. We're like 2% different to them because we are similar. We're primates as well. Um, and then by protein synthesis, you know, chimps and humans make very similar insulin. I know I'm repeating, but it's fitting in here. And pig insulin is also quite similar, but then they couldn't use pig insulin for diabetics because a lot of people were allergic, okay? 
Um, the DNA is also shared. The genetic code is shared. We all make proteins in the same way. Any organism that respires, even a bacteria and an amoeba and a pro other protists and fungi, if they respire, they've got, well, they've got mitochondria, but remember mitochondria has been taken up by endosymbiosis. But anyway, you remember that story? Okay, but they're not going to ask you that. But we've all got enzymes to help us make whatever we, our cells need. And then we're loading. We all make catalase enzymes. Remember the one that breaks down hydrogen peroxide? Yeah, that's one. So we all got, we've got common DNA, but also different DNA to make us different from each other, variation in the species, and make us different from other species. Slightly different from other primates, very different from amoeba and whatever else. All right. What else do we have here? I feel like I'm doing lots of writing. Where's my tenth page? So genetics, um, so the more closely related, the more similar the nucleotide sequences, um, like hemoglobin A. So you, you'll see questions where they give you different sequences and compare you know, the, the DNA sequence and then see how it's different. There's a picture here now. All right. Um, yeah, so the more distantly related, the species are the, the more different the, G, the DNA is, the more different the protein. The more similar, similar they are, the more similar the DNA, the more similar the protein. Okay, so our chimp and human DNA for um, the gene called insulin is 98% identical, but chicken insulin is very different. Only 64% of the gene for um, chicken DNA is the same as ours. So we definitely couldn't use that as a substitute for. You know, if we had diet, if we had diabetes. Okay, yeah. So now there's this weird picture, and I've actually I haven't had time to print it. I wish I had. Um, it's this evidence of evolution. But what I've, I've now um, copied all the folders over, and I'm going to put them on there this weekend, and you can just read through this, not print it, and I'll give you the one with the answers, and it goes through everything we've done. So. Um, the horses, the evolution of the horse's limb, the little em oh, we haven't done embryos yet, the pentadactyl limb, it's all the evidence for evolution, homologous, analogous, and then uh, DNA and enzymes and proteins. Okay, so this one I find a bit difficult to follow. It's about hemoglobin, the alpha chain, and if you compare, I was battling with these codes here, but um, if you look, um, the gorilla and the human hemoglobin is very similar. They use letters here instead of A, B, C, G, C, whatever. They are more similar than they are. They've been um, different to turtle hemoglobin. And then it's just a continuation. But it's not such a lack of picture. There's a nicer one in this that I've given you. And it's a nice simple explanation for that. Does that make sense though? Okay, so even looking at the DNA, you can see how similar we are to chimp and gorillas, but we're not so similar to a turtle or reptile. Right. And detail like this, you know, alpha, whatever, wait, uh -uh. just you understand the concept. Last page of the, that evidence for evolution, which I'm going to put on. All right, so the last in, um, evidence for evolution. This is my favorite. Embryological similarities, and I have mentioned this. So if you look at embryos of fish, reptiles, birds, humans, what's missing, fish, amphibians, they all look similar. And there's a lovely picture in that, uh, I got that off the internet, and we normally do it as an activity over three days. But if you just go and read it, it's so nice. I'll give you the model answer. You can see, well, the, oh, in our, just trips over my bag. Um, even the, er, the earlier embryos before this, okay, so much earlier embryos, they would look very similar. But now you can start seeing that they're starting to look like what they're going to become. So fish, you know, they're developing the tail, reptiles here, birds, maybe that's going to become the wing. Okay, so they're still, still sort of looking similar. All right, but what's interesting is how do we know that all of these, all these vertebrates arose from a common ancestor? Well, they all have these things called gill slits, which become the gills in a fish, all right, but inside um, mammals and birds and whatever, they go inside and they become part of the cartilages of your voice box. And I've got a nice picture in one of my PowerPoints, and I'm also going to upload that. That's amazing. The gill slits, what allow um, the fish to breathe. Where the water, you know, they breathe in the mouth, the water comes out the gills. But now in the womb, they're not breathing like that. The mother's supplying them with 
um, with mammals, the mother supplying via the placenta, the birds are getting oxygen via the yolk and the blood vessels, and through the shell, okay? So it's a little bit different, but they've got these gill slits. So when fish, or when embryos become fish, then they breathe through the mouth and out the gill. But in other animals, they become different things. So in reptiles, you don't see the gill slits anymore. They're inside. They become part of, I don't know if it's the voice box of a croc. I don't know if it's the voice box of a bird, but I definitely know that the gill slits, the cartilage is in there, become part of our voice box. So that shows common ancestry. Um, what do you call it? Adaptive radiation. Adapting to different environments. Water, dry land, flying and... Mammals, us. Okay, divergent evolution from a common ancestor. Do you remember that from yesterday? All these words, divergent evolution. Okay, descent with modification from that ancestor. Being able to swim and walk like a reptile, fly like a bird and human. Okay, whatever. Jump like a kangaroo. And there they are. Could you tell the difference? No. And that's what that worksheet of mine shows. But inside, in an adult shark, those are the gill slits, because they still breathe in, they can't keep still. So the water goes in and out the gill slits, but they've got to keep moving. But fish have to open them, wait. Sharks swim with their mouths open to get water in, but fish can stand still and do this and pump water in. It's just different, okay? And in us, it becomes part of our vocal cords. Right, that's more um, general uh, sort of background information, not something that you really need to study. But now in this little um, evidence of evolution, one that I'm going to put on, um, I'll just show, yeah, it started with little early embryos, then they start looking more different, and then the third page is when it looks like a fish, and it looks like a salamander, and a little tortoise, and a chick, and a rabbit, and a human, you can really start seeing that they are older embryos, or fetuses, sorry, that they are different. Okay, I ran out. So we're not quite finished, which is, um, I still need to do this to your audience. Mm -hmm. Mommy, just hang on, ladies, just hang on a second. Oh dear, this is now we're going to be teaching together, and I haven't seen. So, what I might do is do this the rest of it. I don't know how far ma'am got today. So, what I might do is from this to your organs on, which is make a recorded lesson. Okay, and then um, we're going to chat on the weekend to see where we are carrying on when we've got this group now, not two classes from next week. And we know that, eh? All right, so should we airdrop? Okay, so this has gone up. I think I better...